Hi, everyone. I am here with a congressional candidate running to represent California's 26th district. His name is Daniel Wilson, and he is running as a nonpartisan individual, but a progressive leftist. And uh, he's here to talk about his campaign. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. So what made you want to run for Congress? Because this is, out of all the candidates that I've spoken with, it's very, very tiring. It's grueling. And on top of that, um, you know, you, uh, this is self-sacrifice, right? So what made you want to run and what kind of influenced your decision to run as nonpartisan? So uh, there's a lot that kind of goes into that. So the final, I would say the final straw for me deciding to run was just um, the 2020 pandemic, I'm, you know, the entire year of 2020 just, blew the doors wide open and you know we knew that there was some corruption and we knew that there was these problems but they kind of all just got laid wide open and yeah so i just i kept watching kept kept watching and you know we we protested at my my member of congress's house last summer with the people's party demanding you know the, the people's stimulus cancel rents mortgages medicare for all these things i've since pulled pulled away from the people's party and, and i'm running completely nonpartisan. and the reason for that is because in my conversations with people, whether it was I worked at my county elections office, I volunteered at the polls for a number of years, and then also just in my political act, you know, being engaged with with politics. When you have conversations with people, one of the first things they want to say is, well, you know, oh, are you are you a stupid Democrat or you're a dirty Republican? And and I would say, well, actually, no, I'm neither. And Mike, you would see them physically relax mm. and they would go, oh, what does that mean? Or tell me about that. And so instead of them, you know, instead of things going tribal and everybody like hunkering down on their sides and just it, they, we actually have a conversation and yeah. we're able to create dialogue and find that we agree on more things than we disagree on. And so that plus, you know, what we watched happen with, with Bernie Sanders in 2020 and 2016 and 2020 and what the DNC did to him. Um, the complete coalescing of the establishment candidates, right, to, to trounce somebody. And then we just continue watching it. And I mean, uh, Nina Turner was one of the final blows where we see the DNC, the GOP and, you know, Israeli lobbyists coalescing behind the establishment candidate that they know that they can control to silence somebody who they know is going to go in there and, and change things. And uh, there's a lot of conversations to be had about what, what Nina has been doing since then. But I know that she would have gone in there and been a fighter for us. And I know that there would have, she would have been one of the best things that we'd ever had seen in Congress yet. I think that she really would have bolstered the squad and kind of reinvigorated them. Um, but all of, all of the hamstring, all of the, all of the dirty dealings, all of the backdoor stuff, all of the putting their finger on the scale. Um, just, I just didn't want to, I just absolutely didn't want to be a part of it. And so my, the incumbent that I'm running against is a establishment corporate Dem. She won't co-sign Medicare for all. She won't co-sponsor the green new deal while sending letters to the constituents saying, I support Medicare for all and I'm a climate advocate, but you won't come co-sponsor the legislation that's gonna make it happen. So, yeah. but she's, 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 not, she's not, you know, a, a party star, but she toes the party line every time. She's a good soldier. She gives money when she's told, she supports the people. She showed up to back Newsom in the recall. You know, she does what she's told. She follows, she mm -hmm. follows orders. And so she votes party line 98, 99% of the time. And they're never, they, they were never going to support me anyway. So, you know, I've had a lot of pushback. A lot of people who, you know, are leftists are still like, oh, you got to run Democrat. Are you never going to make it? got to run Democrat. Are you never going to make it? I'm so tired of hearing that. And that's exactly why I'm determined to make it. Because until somebody like me makes it through, I mean, Bernie did it. Bernie run, got into Congress as an independent. So this isn't even completely breaking the mold here. This has been done. We've had independent members of Congress. Um, people just don't like it. So they, they continue yeah. to tell you that it can't be done. And for a variety of reasons, their conflict is either they don't want it to change or they truly don't believe it's possible. Either mm -hmm. way, um, we, need to, we need to make change. And so, uh, yeah, all, all of that is kind of why I decided to run, why I decided to throw my hat in the ring. I knew that our community and our, our district needed better and that also having a fighter in Congress here and there would also make huge differences, not only in our local community, but nationally. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, I, I'm of the belief that basically 99 times out of 100, Duverger's law will, will hold. And unless you run in one of the two parties in most districts, 
it's it's you don't have a chance. But in right. California, it's interesting because you all have this jungle type primary. I'm not yep. sure what it's called, and I've kind of warmed up to it because we have it in uh, California and Washington, but Oregon, out of the you know West Coast, is the only state that doesn't have it, and we all voted it down. And I think it was 2014, and now I kind of regret that because it does open the door really to um, you know a socialist candidates, nonpartisan candidates, which is really interesting because I think that you're right about this idea that so many uh, so many people see that party label as a non-starter. But at the same time, you also see a lot of people, normie Democrats, who I think that leftists should probably try to win over somehow. They're also loyal to the party. So as leftists, we have the most difficult job. Like we have to walk that fine line of trying to make sure that we don't scare away the normies because we don't want them to think we're these like extremists uh, who are going to, you know, I don't know, take, take away their private property. Uh, right. And we also have to, um, you know, we have to work to an extent with people who we don't like. So I like that you're kind of using this unique opportunity to run as a nonpartisan because in a way it gives you an advantage. I mean, it, there are pros and cons, I'm sure, right? Like you, um, you you don't get access to the infrastructure that the Democratic Party has, but at the same time, as a marketing standpoint, you really can appeal to people who I think are non-voters, who are dissatisfied with the status quo, more independent-minded. And I think that even if you change the way that you explain some policies, you might be able to appeal to some open-minded right-wingers not yeah. all of them. And it depends on how you sell certain policies. But I think that you have that opportunity. Uh, what is the reception that you've received? Um, because I'm sure that you've held, um, you know, events. I'm not sure if you're doing in-person events and whatnot. What's the re reception that you've received from someone that you kind of talked about? How they were immediately, they, like their guards were up when you said, I'm running for Congress. But when you told them you weren't a Democrat or a Republican, can you recall a single person who was like either conservative leaning? Like, did that actually change and make them more open to left wing ideas? Because I think this is really important to learn about. Yeah. And so I think that, yes. So specific conversations. I actually had one um, at so, uh, one of the local community members here does a, a pop up in the uh, it's basically just a lot, but she's, she does a pop-up where she lets local um, merchants and vendors and, and food people come and, and do stuff. And she's raising money to turn that into a sensory garden for, for our homeless community. Hmm. Because that's some of the best things that we can do is just try and give them a safe place to be where they, they aren't going to be hassled and, and, and harangued by the, by the police or the authorities. So um, uh, at this, at this pop-up event, um, I was talking to this gentleman and he's, he's a veteran like myself um uh, much much older veteran and he even he even told me he said i i'm conservative I, I vote republican every time um and not only did this gentleman end up spending two hours in the cold talking to me because i could see him start to shiver and he still kept talking to me he still was fully engaged and um not only that he he came back the next week and he has called me and we are now going to go out to lunch one day this week um so there's him specifically but then also there's uh, another gentleman who I've connected with online. Um, we did a live stream on, on his thing, and, and he considers himself, uh, he voted for Bernie in 2016, the primary, but he says he took a hard right where the rest of us went left. He, he voted mm. for Trump. In our recall, he was supporting Larry Elder. And just on the face Oof. of those facts, right, just on the face of those facts, him and I would not get along. We would have nothing to conversate about. Him and I did a live stream on one of his, his uh, IG live streams that he does, and we talked for four hours. Not once were we rude or disrespectful. Not once did we get into any type of screaming match. And we disagreed on, 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 a, on a handful of things, but we actually agreed on more than we disagree. Hmm. Um, he considers himself more of a, a libertarian, more of a moderate. And so, you know, he's for Medicare for all, but we disagree on how to do it. And so that's what I've really found is that it's, it's the slogans, it's the, it's the misinformation, and it's, 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 I mean, it really boils down to all of it is just information um, yeah. with Medicare for all, with defund the police, with, you know, climate change, Green New Deal, all of that. I mean, even how long did it take us to shift from global warming to climate change because we couldn't get anybody to believe in global warming while there was snow on the ground. Right. So it, it, it's messaging and it's, it's, it's what I have found. And especially, so I guess the best example I could give you, um, rather than a specific person is a specific policy. So defund the police. My father is a police officer. My uncle is a police officer. My cousin is a police officer. Um, they've also served in the military and a variety of things. And so um, both my parents voted for Trump in 2016. I am kind of the unicorn. Um, they, had, they didn't in 2020, and I'd like to take a little bit of credit for that. Um, 
Uh, my mom is even <laughs> yelling about Medicare for all now because she had to pay for wow. her, for her rehab. No, she she had to stop going to rehab after her breast cancer surgery because uh, it was sixty dollars mm. a time and she couldn't afford to it. <sighs> anyway, I'm not even answering your question anymore. Uh, let's go back to the specific. So um, we're talking about defund the police. It, when you say that immediately, the conservatives, Republicans, even some, even a lot of Democrats shut down. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to talk about it. They love their police, support the blue, all of that. Um, and it takes someone who is in a police family who has been and involved in for me to kind of break through. And so I, there's, mm -hmm. there's a, a lot of unique traits about myself where I don't fit into any one thing. I'm a veteran, but I'm trans. You know, I was raised by conservative Republicans, but I'm very much an extreme leftist. Um, I'm not a politician. I think that's one of the best things about me. Um, so uh, those things kind of give me a little bit of an edge and a little bit of an advantage or a way to speak to somebody that wouldn't, wouldn't hear something else. And, and it's giving me a unique opportunity. And so with Defund the Police, so I say, look, you might not like that slogan. You might, you know, you, you bristle against it. Let's talk about the facts and the ideas instead. Let's remove, let's get rid of the slogan. Let's look at the amount of police funding, the amount of police responsibility. If you love and support your police, then you should actually want us to pull back these things. And because I know personally, I don't want my dad going to deal with people who are on a 5150 who are, are psych, you know, psych, um, having suicidal issues or any type mm -hmm. of other mental thing. He's not trained for that. He's a good yeah. dude and I don't believe that he would shoot them but he's not a trained mental health professional and he should not be sent to handle things like that. And so when you bring it from a perspective of, look, these police officers over decades have been given more and more social societal responsibilities without any training or handling on how to do such, you know, they're given a, a spit smock, right? Like police have a thing to put over somebody's head so they can't spit on you. Like this stuff is insane. And that's, that's their, that's their training, right? They're trained to contain, and bring things down and to, to, to stop. And even, even our de-escalation training needs to go better. But I won't go so, so, so short-sighted as to say that all we need is police reform. I think we need police reform. I think we absolutely need to, the way I've been stating it is we need to divest from police services and reinvest into our community. So instead yeah. of just shutting down the police department, what I'm saying is, is remove some of their responsibilities. Let's create a mental health rapid response team and train our dispatchers to know when somebody's calling in, do they need a police officer? Is there a violent armed situation that they are encountering? Are they somebody on the side of the road who just needs maybe something like a transit support or something like a transportation support? You got a flat tire, you've been in a car accident. Somebody with a gun doesn't need to be at a scene for a car right. accident. Somebody with a gun doesn't need to be handling somebody who wants to kill themselves, especially when we have now seen repeatedly people use that to kill themselves because they know that if they point a gun at a police officer, they're going to get shot. Well, maybe mm -hmm. if we stop sending police officers to deal with people who are suicidal, that will stop happening. And all, to save the police officer too, because if they had to take down somebody, that, that sticks with them, right? And I know that there's a lot of things that can be said about that. Mm -hmm. But we don't put them in that situation. We remove the opportunity for it to go back. And so yeah. that's, that, when, I, when I talk about that and when I talk about it from a perspective of helping the police, helping the community, providing more resources instead of just the police are bad, we need to destroy them, then people will start to hear you. And so I really think it is, it's, it's, it's messaging and it's how we come about it. But I also don't think we need to kowtow and bow and, and acquiesce to anything either. Yeah. We still need to push hard for these things, but we can adjust the way we discuss it and focus on more reparative than destructive folks. Mm. That's that's really interesting. The way that you're describing it is it seems like they're really receptive to your message and you're kind of demystifying all of these ideas that are seen as, you know, oh, this is the boogeyman, right? Yeah. Um, and that's interesting because if you hear about a candidate who's trying to win over everyone, uh, trying to appeal to conservatives, you would expect, okay, well, What's getting what's getting cut? What's on the chopping block? What are you sacrificing to appeal to them? But that is not the case. Looking at your platform, it's amazing. You are running uh, with reparations front and center, Medicare for all. And so to have that message um, and and to not water it down, but rather explain it, I think that really can go a long way. It just is a mean a matter of uh, reaching out to enough people 
to win this uh, this uh, election or make it into the yeah. runoff. That's when you really that's that's you know when you have a, a huge opportunity. I wanted to ask you about your history in this particular district, um, and if you were an activist in the district, if you lived in the district, what is your relationship to the district, and how do you feel like you can meet the specific needs of the people in that district? Because I think that nationally speaking, your politics are really really popular, but. What do you think is the main issue that is really going to galvanize voters in this district to vote against that incumbent? Sure. So um, a couple things. And actually something that we went through last night is a perfect example. Um, we were on a five hour city council call last night. Um, there was over 80 of us that showed up to speak on one agenda item. We were proposing rent control measures for Ventura County, um, Oxnard City specifically. And um, I was so proud and so moved that so many people showed up. I, like I said, 80 and there's a wonderful new law that has been passed where they have to give us three minutes each for public comment. No questions. They cannot re remove or do anything about that, no matter what you're saying. And, you know, there's, there's good and bad to that. Um, I've, I've, I've seen just, some of the viral videos. <laughs> right? sometimes, they get, sometimes they get a little abused. But um, I think that it's time. I think that that is exactly how we put pressure on these people. And that's exactly how we hold their feet to the fire, showing up at these things. And letting our voice be heard so specifically so ventura county so i'm actually a transplant here i was born and raised on the east coast of maryland i lived there until i was about 24 and i joined the navy um i went to chicago for my training went to florida for my training and then i got order stationed to point magoo uh here in california ventura county um i got off of the plane in november and it was 70 degrees and i said i'm never going back what <laughs> is this amazing place so I've never liked the cold. Maryland doesn't get enough snow to make it worth it anyway. So um, I love it here. So I've been here since 2009. Um, I've lived in Port Winnemi, a small state, a small military city here. There's two bases in my county, which is really interesting. Um, one is the CB base. Um, it's the major base. It's the port. It's the actual the, the naval port as well. Um, and then there's a smaller base, uh, Point Magoo, that I was stationed at, which is more aviation. Um, so I was, a, I was an aviation structural mechanic here at Point Magoo. I got out in 20, 2013. And I started going to college. I um, used my GI Bill. So I've gone to our local community college. I used the transfer program to get into our um, university here. Graduated with my bachelor's. And um, as most of us know, you can basically wipe your butt with a bachelor's today. Um, I was lucky <laughs> Unfortunately, enough, when I, when yeah. I, right, when I, when I graduated with my bachelor's, I was so thankful to get a job mm. at Starbucks as a shift supervisor for $16 an hour. It was the most money I'd ever made in my life, too. So I was happy. Um, so that was great. Um, but so that, that was kind of my first. So um, while I was in the military, kind of in and out, not really involved. Um, to be honest, uh, going to school was really my first getting getting to know my community and getting engaged and involved in, in local events. Um, nothing activist wise. I'm not going to give myself that much credit. Um, but mm -hmm. then, you know, going forward, um, when I was working at Starbucks um, in 2017, 2018, that was when we had some of the worst fires that we had ever seen in California. Mm. And the community response was amazing. Like I'm getting chills just thinking about it. It was amazing. We would have people, we had firefighters coming in when I was working at Starbucks and people would say, I'm buying their coffee and you know, little things like that, right? And that's how it started. And then we had people start coming in, buying whole buckets of coffee and, and scones and, and, and pastries and stuff and taking it to the lines, taking it out to the firefighters on the line or to the department, to the, to the fire station, and they were taking it out. And so we, as, as some of the shift managers there, we decided to do that same thing. At the end of our shift, we took a whole bunch of coffee. We got some food and a bunch of different things, masks, and we went. And we went fire department by fire department. We went, we went um, uh, volunteer station by volunteer station. And they kept turning us away because so many people had donated and brought them things that they weren't going to be able to use it. And so it took us probably about an hour or two to just find a place that still had need. And I was just so blown away at the community response showing up because there, it, this isn't just food. There, people were bringing clothes to like their people's houses were being burned down. People were being not evicted, but um, evacuated from their, from mm -hmm. their homes. And so, you know, running with just the clothes on your back. So even if, you know, you might have your belongings to go back to, we were, people were getting put up in hotels, the city paid for, for things like that to happen. That was really when a lot of stuff community wise started changing for me. And I saw, the beautiful place that I lived in, and it has not stopped. Every, it just keeps going, and, and through the pandemic as well, there's a bittersweet uh, specific thing that happens here in our community that I wish didn't have to happen, but is so beautiful still when I see it. 
I didn't understand it at first when I saw it. I saw people on the street, um, you know, doing car washes to raise money, um, which, you know, you see boys and girls clubs and cheerleaders and sports teams do that. But these were different. And, and I pulled into a couple, come to find out they were raising money to be able to bury their loved one. Mm. And so it is actually a regular thing here, you know, maybe not once a month, but several times, at least throughout the year, just in our city. So I can only imagine throughout the state or throughout the country if this exists, where they are doing car washes and, you know, selling sweets. And, you know, they have, you know, what's awesome is some of the food truck vendors show up and give, you know, rate, any of the funds they give, they give to the family and stuff like that. And so, yeah, but people have to do car washes to, to, to bury their loved ones. But our community shows up and shows out to make sure that they have what they need to do. So, um, yeah. And so all of that has really just made me fall in love with Oxnard more and more. Oxnard Ventura, the the, the entire community here in Ventura County. Um, I specifically am really close to Oxnard, so that is where I, I see a lot of this stuff happening. Um, and it's also the community that that needs the support the most. And you know, to go into your so Bernie Sanders, twenty sixteen was what awoken me to any type of politics. For most of my life, I was a non-voter, um, to be honest. I didn't even vote when Barack Obama was being elected. Um, part of that was I was in the military and I, I didn't uh, believe in the absentee voting because in Maryland at the time, they just stuffed them in a basement and it, it did never get counted unless there was a tie. And those are very electoral things that absolutely need to be changed. Yeah, there's some states where the, That's absentee, actually... ballots, the absentee ballots are only counted. I don't know all of the states, but there are some states where the absentee ballots are only counted if there is a that seems weird. Yeah. Interesting. This also, look was into over, this also was over a decade ago. So I do not know what current legislation is on the books, especially mm. in Maryland. I have not been there for over a decade. Um, and I might have been misinformed at the time, truly, because that is also another part of it. Yeah, topic. I was going to say that sounds like a big scandal. So I would I would yeah. I would <laughs> yeah. imagine that's not um, the case. And I definitely I definitely should maybe uh, do a little do some background research on that. But that was that was my belief. Let me let me start saying that it was my belief that my vote didn't matter anyway. So I did. Right. Vote. And that is that is that is the point, right? That's what they want us to believe. Um, yeah. So, um, 2016, Bernie Sanders woke me up. Started volunteering at the polls. So, from 20, 2016, 2017, with the working with Bernie Sanders campaign, volunteering at the polls, watching our the fires devastate our community, the community outpouring, and I just haven't been able to stop since. I volunteered at the polls 2016, 2018, 2019. I got a job at my county elections office. I put on three elections for us in this county last year. Um, through the pandemic. It was some of the craziest stuff I've ever seen and been through in my life. Also the most rewarding and exhausting thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and so, but it wasn't until probably last year, if I'm being fully honest, where I started being an activist and actively mm. doing and calling for things. So while I was doing things in my community and, you know, like I said, doing car washes and things like that and, and you know, supporting our community members, I didn't know how to do anything bigger um, and to be honest, it was kind of overwhelming when even you go to look at all of these social justice programs and, and things like that. Which one do I want to be a part of? Who's doing this? Who's doing what? And sometimes it's so overwhelming that people just, uh, I'm just going to get involved when I can, right? Mm -hmm. A variety of things like that. Um, so I would consider myself uh, at that point a typical American, right? I'm just going about my business, working and, and doing the best that I can um, until I saw what Bernie showed us was possible is that our representatives could stand for us. They could fight for us. They could speak to and actually care about us. And that when we showed up, we could actually make a change. And so in 2020, when the pandemic hit and, you know, just they gave us what? One stimulus check of $600 and then said, you know, they, they went on a three month vacation with, with, with nothing and no, no concern for, for any of us. Um, so that was when I decided I, I need to get involved. I found out the DSA wasn't, I didn't have really any intention at the time to create a political party. So that's when I started working with the People's Party. Um, I tried to form my own local chapter here. We held some protests. I actually protested in front of my representative's house, demanding that she fight for Medicare for all, do, do anything for us. Our homeless numbers were exploding every day. I saw more and more people on the streets. Our food lines were miles long in every city, not just the, not just the poorest town, but the richest towns as well were also having, having food insecurity issues. Um, and the silence from our leadership was absolutely deafening in mm -hmm. their abdication of any responsibility to, to do anything. They're like, oh, now we've passed an eviction moratorium, so you're fine. Meanwhile, people are still being evicted or forced out of their homes for, you know, loopholes and other things that landlords are finding. And uh, 
so uh, kind of kind of all of that. I don't know if I even necessarily answered your question. But... No, I, I think it, that this is really like for you to talk at length. That's really important because what I want viewers to do is get to know you, um, you know, and, and get the opportunity to see who you are. What was the catalyst for your political awakening? And it seems like you have a pretty similar story as a lot of people, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders, on top of that, you, you have very clearly diagnosed the issues. One thing I will say, I did uh, look it up for your state. Uh, so the absentee ballots are counted. So I just want to correct that. Yeah, no, no bad um, record here. Yes, yes. Okay, so fact check in, in fact real check. time. Okay, but now I'm going to put you in the hot seat. So Good. we know that you have all the answers, right? <laughs> we know that uh, if you're a viewer of the Humanist Report, you're going to like Daniel's platform. I, I guarantee it. But as a legislator, it's a little bit different. Sometimes you get put into these weird predicaments that are sometimes bad, sometimes morally gray. And I just want to know in hypothetical situations how you would uh, deal with this just from your perspective. So sure. let's say hypothetically speaking, you worked really hard. You introduced uh, a bill and uh, let's just say it's it's. Uh, climate change related, right? It's not the Green New Deal, but it's a climate change bill. And you got lots of co-sponsors, you got committee hearings on it, and it's finally going to be put into a piece of, uh, or a package. Um, but even though this bill that you kind of worked really hard on, your constituents want it, you staked your career on it, is in this package, there's also a poison pill in that package. And that poison pill is, uh, let's say it's something to do with funding, um, I don't know, um, or defunding uh, public education or, or police. It's, it's a really bad poison pill, and it's it goes against everything you stand for, but in that package is kind of your pride and joy as a lawmaker. What do you do? Do you vote for that package, passing what you want, and accept that poison pill, or do you withdraw? I would say there'd be a variety of factors that would go into that. It would really depend, you know, where are the stakes? Is it that the Republicans or the, the holdouts will only vote for this bill with that poison pill in there. If that is the, if we have exhausted all negotiations and we've gotten to the point where these, these senators, let, let's, let's use a perfect example of what we have going on right now, Kristen Sinema and Joe Manchin, who are holding out or saying that, you know, the leftists need to continue compromising and backpedaling and you know, we've already been talked down from 10 to 6 to 3.5, and now they want us to accept 1.5. And, you know, Corey, Corey Bush and Jamal Bowman absolutely slammed them on the radio on the news that was show great. the other day. It was absolutely, you did a great episode on that as well. Um, the, it's, that, that's what we need is that pushback. So I would do exactly what they're doing and more. So not only, and what, what Bernie is finally starting to do, not only do we go and have on every news show every day, the problem is always education and information. And so where the, the, the major messaging failures are of the Democratic Party is they'll, 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 they'll tote and they'll all retweet these same things, these same things, these same things about this garbage about, oh, it's a gold star veteran day. But we cannot get them to unify on these messaging and on these images on the platform of what we need. And they're always responding instead of, instead of being forewarned. So I would be on every news show, every day, every radio show, everything I could do, me and the people that would be supporting me and fighting for this. And then you hold rallies in those people's districts. You hold, you hold protests at their houses, you hold protests in their districts, and you inform their constituents about what they are doing and what they are costing and what they are trying to shove down America's throat. I would say that at the absolute end of the day, I would exhaust every absolute possible option, rallying everybody. Letters to the editor like Bernie just wrote, good on him. Now all of a sudden Joe Manchin's like, hey, we're talking, it worked. And so those are the things that we need to do. Um, I cannot say that there is never a poison pill that I would vote for. If it gets my people healthcare, if it gets my people housing and education, I cannot say that there is not a poison pill I will never vote for in Congress. There is probably some that I'm going to have I will do everything in my power and exhaust all options, including sitting with my own two feet in their front door, asking them why they won't do it. I like that. I like that answer because you're being truthful and honest and you're thinking through, you're not willing to just accept it. You're willing to fight, but at the end of the day, 
you know, you are telling us what you do as a lawmaker. And I think that that's really important. Uh, okay, another hypothetical situation. I love hypotheticals, so you'll have to bear with me. It's insufferable, but I love them. Um, okay, let's say you are trying to get a committee hearing for another piece of legislation that you really care about. It's near and dear to your heart. But one of the co-sponsors who you think is gettable is not really willing to support you because it looks likely that you're going to endorse their primary opponent. <laughs> and they don't like that. They don't want you to do that. So in this situation, what do you do? Do you endorse their primary opponent and say, okay, I'll try to find the, the support somewhere else? Or do you realize this is pretty crucial and I kind of need his support? Maybe my, my endorsement won't do much. Tell me like what your thinking process would be in that scenario, because it's really tough. Uh, I, I don't know what I would do, but I want to know what you would do as a lawmaker. Sure, absolutely. So I think that in the question is kind of the answer, because that's another thing. That's another tool in the toolkit that our, our legislators aren't using often enough when they get to a point where the the, the roadblock will not move. You know, Joe Manchin won't budge, Chris Sinema won't budge. Then you go primary them. Like, that's the point. That's exactly what you should do. And so that that would be the leverage. I would tell the, the congressperson, you're going to vote for this or I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that you're primaried and, and, and that you're, you're no longer supporting, you, that you're no longer serving. Um, I said that really weird, but I don't know. I don't know how I would go and give them give them a good one, too. Um, I'd probably say it better. But, you know, basically set down the line that we need your vote on this. And if you are not willing to do what the people need, then I am going to make sure that you get replaced by somebody that will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so use, so use, the, use their primary challenger as the leverage instead of it being something that scares you away. Lean into it. They're already concerned about it. Like, maybe if you vote for this legislation, then I wouldn't. Think it. Okay, I like that. I like that. Um, uh, one more thing that I want to ask you, I, I like your tactics because they're very aggressive. Going to the houses of lawmakers is one of the most badass things you can do because that's the number one thing that they hate. Having said that, though, as a lawmaker yourself, uh, odds are you'll face resistance. And let's say you get elected, you win. And then there's this Fox News segment from Tucker Carlson. And he's saying, look at this. Californians elected Daniel Wilson, who is a radical communist Who's next? He wants to take away your your housing. He wants to take away your health care. And there's this, you know, there's this it will happen if you get elected. And then there's the, you know, a bunch of uh, Republicans that are really resisting you. They they show up just from a personal standpoint. How do you deal with that pressure? Because it's one thing to anticipate it. But when it actually happens and it is inevitable, if you get elected, how do you how do you think you would handle that? I mean, you, you have life experience. You're a veteran. You've been in predict in really unpredictable situations. How do you think you would deal with that? Um, because I think that normal people it would bog them down. But how do you think you would hold up? And it's impossible to say not having experienced that, but talk through your life experiences that you think kind of thickened your skin, because I think that's really necessary if you're a member of Congress. Yeah, absolutely. I would say, um, you know, uh, growing up in my household, we did, did a little bit of it. And then um, anything that I wasn't hardened on, the military definitely helped in that. And, you know, there's some good and bad to that. But yeah. um, I said this on a podcast I was on last time, you know, with, with what we had, um, the... AOC being being yelled at on the floor by Nancy Pelosi and changing her vote. Uh, mm -hmm. I said that would never happen to me because there's nobody in Congress that's going to say or do anything worse to me than my RDCs and drill instructors did. Like, you can't. It doesn't matter. I've, I've, I've literally faced down some of the craziest stuff I've ever seen in my life. Um, there's, there's nothing that you screaming at me is going to do. Um, I would say as far as, you know, I have a purple district here. It's, 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 it's mislabeled as a D plus 20 because we, the Democrats do have a slight majority numerically. But the Republicans show up in, in strength and they, they're, they're, the Democrat foothold isn't as strong as they would like to believe it is. Um, so we're more. Do you know the results from the last election in 2020? I, I have all of that very much memorized. So let me let me answer this and then I can I can nail down all of that. for OK, you. yeah, it's actually all of that is why it's another reason why I know that this can happen. So um, so I've got say I got Republicans in my district, which there are a lot of there are a lot of conservative Republicans in my district. Even if we weren't a military town, that you know definitely adds to it. But all of that, I'm not gun shy. I'm not afraid to go out and take some heat. I'm not afraid to deal with things. What was interesting when I went and protested in front of Julia Brownlee's house as my incumbent, um, she sat in her car the entire. I didn't realize it at the time, but later I realized in, in footage and stuff that we watched this this SUV idled 
It was either her or her secret service. It was idled this car idled outside for three hours. Do you care about the climate? It idled outside for three hours um, uh, while we were outside protesting. And so what I would have done in that situation is gone and talked to them. Mm. Yeah. People are allowed to be upset. There are a lot of things happening in this country that everybody has a right to be upset about. They're very valid criticism. And the problem is they don't have a place to put that anger or a way to direct it. And so when they, when they show up at your houses, when they've been pushed to such extremes that they're willing to go to your member of Congress's house, they've got something that they need to say to you. Hear them. Hear them. Go, there, wasn't, there, wasn't, there wasn't a thousand of us. There was maybe 10 people that showed up to that first protest. OK, so there was in no way, any way, shape or form. And I, I guess you could say that maybe you felt your life was in danger. But we said loudly that we come in peace. We played music. We wanted to do things. Um, we had no intention of doing anything harmful. At any, we, we took we had chalk. We drew pictures on the sidewalk. There was no there was no threat in any way, shape or form. And so unless somebody's on my lawn with an AK-47, if they're just <laughs> out there with signs screaming, I'm going to go talk to them. Mm hmm. And so that, that is how you meet your constituents where, you, where they are. That is how you handle the unrest and the upset that these people are rightly feeling is you talk to them because our biggest concern is not being heard. And not that it's that we just need to be heard. Having things happen after we're heard. Having our concerns, needs, and abuses heard, things that are happening and going wrong, they're coming to you crying and begging for help, and you close the door. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening all across the country. It's what's been happening for decades. All they care about is getting reelected. And, you know, I've, I've even had people push back on me, even though you're running nonpartisan, even though you're not going to do this. Once you get in, you're only just going to be concerned about reelection. And I want to put things in place so that we don't have to do that. And I personally, I don't want to be a politician. I don't mm -hmm. have a career goal to do this. So I don't, I don't see that as, as a thing. Like, yes, I would do my job to the best of my ability as long as my constituents continue to vote me in and said that they wanted me there for them. Um, but I also am not going to, even if, even if I would never do 10 years, but that's, that's too much. Like, that's too long. I mm -hmm. think that, I think that, you know, a good, a good eight years is maybe, maybe, maybe as long as anybody should do. There's some conversations we can have about term limits. Like that well, well, I feel like it would melt your brain if you were in there longer than a decade. I mean, how could it not? <laughs> exactly. And, you're, you're, at that, you're, you're so out of touch from the people, the time, yeah. everything that's going on around you. How can you, in good faith, legislate for people that Diane Feinstein has two forty million dollar homes? How do you have yeah. any concept of what somebody literally counting pennies to go put gas in their car is going? Through? Yeah, yeah, and that's that's just that I don't think that you you do. I I think you know if you live a completely different life than your constituents, uh, you're just incapable of representing them adequately. So Daniel, I, I think that you've given us enough to get to know you now. Uh, we know your policy platform and your personality, how you would govern as a lawmaker. But now is uh, the most important part of the interview. Your last pitch to my viewers. Folks, if you like Daniel, um, he's going to give us uh, the pitch. So uh, let us know how we can support you and what you need most. Is it, is it donations? Is it canvassers? Help us help you. Absolutely. So first and foremost, money. Absolutely. Donations are the most important thing for any grassroots candidate, whether they're running in the Democratic Party or not. If they are running grassroots, if they have sworn off um, any type of, I've sworn off, um, lobbyist pack money, corporate pack money. And I'm specifying that because like, say if I were to work with the Sunrise Movement, they have a pack. I would take money mm. from that pack, right? So I don't want to say just a blanket, I won't take any pack money. I will not mm -hmm. take lobbyist pack money. I will not take fossil fuel pack money. I will not take corporate pack money. I will not take any fossil fuel industry, any donor money, any insurance company money, only from the people grassroots. I'm asking people for five, 10, 15. My standard donation right now is $22. Um, running in 2022. So um, hey. you know, Bernie, Bernie, Bernie did his $27, right? So I've got the $22. So $22 is, is, is my standard small ask for anybody that can. There's also the, um, if you go to my donation page, which I believe Mike will have in the information below. Also, if you go to votefordaniel.com, it's at the top right corner of my website, the contribute button, bright yellow. Um, there, uh, there's also the option where you can put in as little as a dollar. You know, So any, anything that anybody can give me, I greatly appreciate. And it, it's absolutely the most important thing that you could do. Because those dollars turn into the postcards that I can print. Those dollars turn mm -hmm. into being able to do a campaign ad. Those dollars turn into being able to expand our email and our canvassing program. So 
Um, first and foremost, absolutely any contributions that any of your viewers would be so kind as to support us with, we would greatly appreciate. You can also go to my website, admofernandio.com, to sign up for our email list. Um, we're adding a volunteer sign up thing very soon. Um, we are, because we are going to be hitting the ground running, um, if not before then, but by December for our Canvas program. So um, donations, canvassers, anybody in the local Ventura County or LA or Santa Barbara area, um, we would love to have your support. Um, anybody who is outside of the state, we are also going to be doing calling and phone banking and text banking, so we can support that way as well. Um, and I would just um, uh, encourage you to go sign up for my email email uh, on my website, and then uh, we will send you information and updates with the volunteers. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. We will continue to follow your campaign on this channel. I always try to follow and keep in touch with all the candidates that I bring on. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll be back in touch again, uh, but we'll, we'll certainly uh, be wishing you luck here. Awesome. I thank you so much. Oh, and uh, at all social medias, all social medias, Daniel 4 VC, Daniel 4 VC, Twitter, social media, all the Instagrams, everything of that. Um, thank you so that much for your time. I, I'm so thankful for this opportunity to be here and to speak with you and all of your viewers. Viewers, I've been a long time viewer, three years, following Mike at least. Um, he's amazing. Anybody that's new, definitely subscribe, hit the like, hit the bell, um, and then go check well, out my website as well. I appreciate you all. Well, thank you. Well, okay, now you've got to support Daniel, folks. <laughs> Plug in the humanist report. I mean, come on. <laughs> thank you so much, Daniel. All right, Mike, you have a good one.